Stay down. Final warning. I could do this all day. Hello and welcome to episode 105 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemiroff and here are my co-hosts, Christy Pachko and Angie Hahn. Hey everybody. Hi. Hello from Austin, by the way. Christy and I are recording in Austin because we're here for South by Southwest and Angie is all alone in New York. Having her own North by Northeast. Yep, yep. All right, so today we are going to have a hot topic and a big review. Hot topic's going to be Captain America Civil War trailer, and then we're going to move on to our full review of 10 Cloverfield Lane. Angie, you have Captain America first. All right, so this week Marvel dropped the second trailer for Captain America Civil War, which is, uh, it's not an Avengers movie, it's a Captain America movie, but it might as well be an Avengers movie because almost all of them are in it, and they're all fighting each other, which is so sad. But the good news is they have a new friend. It's uh, Spider-Man, who comes out at the very end of the trailer. He's played by Tom Holland, and it's notable because it's the first time, it's the first appearance of this specific Spider-Man, and he's the first Spider-Man that's actually part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and not, like, off in his own Sony Marvel franchise that has nothing to do with the rest of the Avengers. Um, so Spider-Man's the biggest news, but I think I mean there's lots of other like there's lots of other awesome stuff in here. I think Black Panther looks amazing. Yeah, and I love the way they use Ant Man. Like they finally give Hawkeye something to do, and it's letting him be an assistant for Ant Man because he puts Ant Man on like the tip of his little arrow and then shoots it. I already forgot. I literally just watched this trailer and already forgot Hawkeye was in it. <sighs> he is in it. And oh, he finally has something to do. So that's very hurtful, Christy. He's never going to win. No. Whatever side he's on is losing. That's how this movie's going to wrap up. Boom. <laughs> I feel like one... Spoilers. One, okay, so one thing that's interesting about these trailers is all of them have been... All of the promos and all the trailers and stuff have been playing up that the Avengers are fighting each other, but we also know there's a straightforward villain in this movie. He's played by Daniel Brühl. It's Baron Zemo, who's a classic Captain America villain, and we haven't seen him at all. So, I don't know. I mean, it, it's... It's a like, really interesting point. Yeah, like, I feel like we're seeing a lot of these trailers, but I'm like, but there's, like, a well, whole actually, other character that we don't that's, know anything about. That's kind of, like, a good point, though, in terms of, you know, we've seen, like most Marvel movies, we've seen a lot of promos, and a lot gets spoiled. And there's a lot in this trailer that I would think would be major spoiler material, but the mm. fact that we haven't seen the main villain makes me really hopeful that there's just so much more to this movie it's than what we've seen. a very good point. It's also, like, because Marvel's done interesting things in the past with some of their villains, like with Iron Man 3, it was such a misdirect where we all thought we knew what to expect of the Mandarin, and then I was like, JK, guys, mm -hmm. JK! Um, so, like, that could be something going on, too. It's like, we're focusing so much, because also, as Angie can attest, because I watched this trailer while she had, we had our webcam on, I had so <laughs> many feelings watching Tony and Captain America fight with each other. Like, it really, and I, I know Angie is even worse, because, like, Angie is, like, more into Marvel Avengers than I am, but, like, it, it genuinely upsets me. I feel like they're real people I know, and I don't like to see them argue. And then that shot where it's, like, all of them running at each other is like, I don't know in what scenario this makes sense, but and it looks so cool. Where Angie and Christy have all the feels while watching this trailer, I apparently had none. I had no emotion Your watching this trailer. Your face you have none, but, I mean... <laughs> I swear to God, things were... The, the wheels were turning in my head. I thought You this also was a, watched it before. I hadn't seen it at Yeah, all I did. Before. I watched it so last night. So there was stuff where I was just like, what? But it's, it's also... It's just a really well-edited trailer. Like, yeah. it's, it's really cool to me when trailers can come together in a way that means something, but without following, like, a specific story structure. Like, I tend to like trailers best when they give me pieces of the story that I can latch onto and want to see more of, mm -hmm. but... This kind of, like, hits a lot of different elements and kind of ties it all together to get back to the same point, which I appreciated. And also, again, that speaks to how the trailer isn't spoiling the main the main narrative. And it's teasing some big action, but it's also teasing some big moments for characters. And that's what really gets me, because, like, Captain mm -hmm. America is personally my favorite Avenger. And that's because, like, of all of them, he's the one I'd want to aspire to be like, because he's very brave. Because, like, yeah, he has superhero serum and stuff, but, like, he can't fly. He doesn't have things, like... There's a scene in the well, first Well, I want to be like Hawkeye, said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a fake out. I was just like, seriously? <laughs> I was just, for she no reason, let's shit on Hawkeye. Hawkeye. I mean, I, I would want to be like Hawkeye in that I would be, I would get to hang out with like Paul Rudd and Linda Cardellini, so. Yeah. Sure. I guess oh, that's Hawkeye's something. like the only one that has like a, a, like a settled home life of them that we know, I guess, because we don't really know what some of their deals are. <laughs> I mean, going back to what you were saying, though, Christy, about how what's impactful about this trailer's emotional moments is it, it also is just, it's Marvel showing what they do best. And, like, I mean, we see so, we have, this isn't even the only superhero on superhero action movie we have coming out this year. 
But what yeah. Marvel does so well is like Captain America Civil War is really building on like what movie, what is this, like the 14th movie or something like that? And this has been, this series has been going on since 2008. And it's really building on all the stuff that they've established over the past eight years and the past 14, 13, 12, whatever, how many films. Yeah. It, I mean, like, we, it, it engages us all on a level where everybody has an opinion. Like, even my mom knows who the Marvel superheroes are, and she may not know their names, but she knows who she likes. And it's like, it gets really exciting. What Marvel does well is they create an event. And, like, this trailer, like, sells that event. Like, it's going to be a thing. Before we wrap this section up, we should uh, probably address the big thing at the end of the trailer, Spider-Man. He looks terrible. Well, my big problem with him is that I think they could have gotten away with it if his eyes didn't squint at the end. Yeah, that's end. weird. That doesn't make that, sense. That, to me, I mean, the whole thing does look animated, but that, to me, screams animated. And that is just wrong, because every time I see him squint, all I can picture is Tom Holland being in a room and someone telling him, say this line, and we'll just throw it in there. Yeah. And that, that was what it was. It's like, it feels, I think also because we're just coming off Deadpool, which is actually really funny and witty, like, that... Peter Parker seems so lackluster to me. It's such a weak thing to end on. Yeah, no, that's I mean, true. I mean, I think it's I think it's a big moment for people who've been waiting to see Spider Man because, despite how popular the Avengers are, Spider Man is still Marvel's most famous superhero by far. So I is mean, it's true? a big moment oh, in wow. that sense. That's but interesting. Before, but before we wrap up, I want to ask Team Iron Man or Team Captain America? Captain America. Captain America. Ha. Me too. We're all Team Cap. Good. We don't have <laughs> Fuck to fight you, each other. Iron Man. <laughs> there will be no Clearly. popcorn and prosecco civil war. This episode's getting an explicit warning. We're going to have to find, like, someone that is Team Iron Man for when we review the episode. I thought there wouldn't be any because, duh, Captain America. But, like, people I uh, people I used to respect are on Twitter <laughs> hashtagging things Team Iron Man. Like, Peter, my, you know, editor uh -oh. at Flashbow. Uh-oh. It's just like, are you fucking shitting me? Yeah, so, <laughs> Flashbow right. is probably not going to last too much longer. Before Angie cuts off ties to all of the important people that she works with, <laughs> let's I move on to uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane. <laughs> so we're going to review this one. And I have it. And the synopsis from IMDb is, after getting in a car accident, a woman is held in a shelter by two men who claim the outside world is affected by a widespread chemical attack. Mm, meh, that's that's kind of... Kind of right, kind of not right. So what it really is is that Mary Elizabeth Winstead plays that woman and she gets into a car accident and this crazy survivalist played by John Goodman is the one who keeps her in the facility. And it's, you know, it's kind of like like a mind fuck in a way where it's like, is he really helping her or is he absolutely crazy? And the other guy in the facility with them is uh, John Gallagher, played by John Gallagher Jr. And... I, I abs first off, I absolutely love this movie. I was in charge of hosting this section because I'm so obsessed with the first Cloverfield as well, which is interesting because I, I obviously don't want to spoil anything, but wh how, how have they been calling it? A, a blood spiritual, relative. a blood relative. Or a spiritual sister. A spiritual, spiritual sister. Sequel. A spiritual oh, you're right, you're sequel. Right. A spiritual sequel. Which um, is a word, which is a bullshit phrase that means absolutely nothing, by the way. Yeah, well, clearly, clearly the two movies are connected in a way. We're not going to spoil how they are connected in the show, in the show, but it's, it's a connection I, I, mean, the I buy. I spoils that. I guess. It's, they're, they're set in the same world. Yeah, they're I, the same cinematic universe, and but the they're way, not as ingrained as, like, Marvel. Uh, they don't connect it I'm anymore. not actually sure that's even true, but maybe we should get into that in the spoilers. So we'll save All it right. for later. So for, so backtracking a bit, as a, as a thriller, this thing is absolutely exceptional and it's because it is so well shot in such a confined space and has such killer performances like john goodman is now like my new nightmare he freaks me out in this movie yeah which is amazing because like i know he's had dark roles before but i grew up with him on roseanne i grew up with him in coen brothers movies that weren't scary because i didn't see barton fink until i was much older so like watching this movie and i talked about it with the director dan trachtenberg i i felt conflicted because like the movie is telling me he's terrifying, but my heart and soul is like, no, John Goodman is a good man. It's his name. Well, the crazy <laughs> thing with what, what the character does, so what he does in that role so well is that like, yeah, he's like a pretty crazy guy that you don't want to trust. But at the same time, then he could like, you know, flip that switch and it's like, well... Maybe. It's I mean, it's in like, that it's, sense, it's really like it's really capitalizing on this image that everyone in America already has of John Goodman. Like, I feel like if they cast someone who is more who, who someone if they cast someone like say Christoph Waltz, someone that we know or as Michael a Shannon, villain character, or Ben Mendelsohn, you would immediately just be like, no, nope, 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 yeah. nope. And I'm gonna nope on out of here. Is. But it's John Goodman, so I think I think it, yeah. 
I think the movie does a really good job of like for like the first maybe like half or the first two thirds, you really you really don't know who to trust. Like you're the movie is told from Mary Elizabeth Winstead's character's perspective, but you don't even know that much about her. So you you're it's it's really this like tense thriller where you're just like you know people are telling each other things and you're not sure how much of the stuff is fabricated. You're not sure how much of it is putting on an act. And I also think that has to do with the way that it blends with genre, because there's also moments of this that feel like a dark comedy. There's like a dinner scene that's kind of funny and weird. There's mm-hmm. a board game scene that is it's both very funny. And very funny. Yeah. And it's like, I said, uh, I interviewed uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead too. And I was talking to her about how what I liked about the movie is it kept me on edge, not just because it was suspenseful, but also because it plays with all these different genres in a way that it doesn't let the audience sit into an expectation. So like, you can't like really predict what's going to come next because you're you've never really seen a movie like this before it's a very clever way to support the cloverfield connection too it's Mm -hmm. like when i think about it it's like oh how could you possibly do a cloverfield sequel or whatever the hell we're calling this thing and this this is not what i would ever expect but it's actually a really smart way to approach it where you can still capitalize off the success of that movie without completely exploiting it i mean i will say if, if if people are going into this movie expecting a follow-up to cloverfield like in a narrative sense i think they're going to be disappointed because whatever ties there oh, are there see, are very flimsy i think i think that's the exact opposite i think there are a lot of people who are going into this expecting a cloverfield sequel and and they're going to have like their minds totally blown I when think they see it because I'm the movie is so good as a, it's so good as a standalone entity, but when we get to the spoiler section, I will talk about why I think it yeah, is appropriate. But here's the thing, and I feel like that's the problem with why it's it's barely related to Cloverfield, and I don't mind that, but I feel like people who are looking for, even though they're saying this is not a Cloverfield sequel, people that are looking for that are going to be disappointed, because that's not really the force. But it's a really good movie. So, like... I, I don't care that I honestly feel like they slapped on Cloverfield at, like, late into production. There's arguments about when it became a Cloverfield movie, but I don't care about that because the movie's so much fun. So if if calling it Cloverfield gets more people to see it, fuck it, I'm fine with it's that. It's so well directed, too. It blows my mind that this is his first feature. It's and very like, confidently like, directed. directed. This, is, this is a guy who, you know, he's had experience directing shorts, and it's not like he just came out of nowhere and no, got he this job. Com- commercials he, and stuff. But he, yeah, he's done commercials, but he's also been in talks for, like, other big projects that I think just never got off the ground. So he's not some, like, random newcomer who just showed up, but still, to have a movie be like this be your first feature on your resume like dude this guy's gonna kill it it especially because like it does this thing where like when you're learning to write a screenplay in college and stuff they tell you never to set it in one location that's death to any screenplay and most of this movie takes place in an underground bunker with like three or four rooms and really i actually found the opposite in film school we were oh. always trying to come up with ways to shoot it in one location just to make the production well, easier. Well, that's like to make production, but when you're learning screenwriting, they tell you, like, that's not visually interesting, you want to vary or whatever, and it's like, this this breaks that rule. I said, like, to me, it felt almost like a stage production that they had adapted into a movie because it's all set in this one area, but where a lot of stage productions like that, uh, like Proof, for instance, feel really static, this feels claustrophobic in just the way you want it to feel claustrophobic. And also, I know when Angie and I saw it, I think you saw it in the same theater, but later, the theater sound system was so good that when there's, like, rumbles and, like, sounds that you don't know what they're supposed to be quite yet, it literally shook the theater, which is fucking terrifying. It was so much fun. The sound design in this is really incredible. I thought maybe at first it was just that my theater was really loud, but every time, like, that that really heavy door in, yeah, her, and like, in her room, her cell slash room, whatever you want to call it, closes, like, it freaked you me feel out. It, yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like in addition to all that stuff, one of the other things that really elevates it past just, like, a generic thriller for me is just how specific this world feels and how, like, lived in it feels and how the characters feel like they ex- continue to exist outside the frame. I mean, I'm talking about, like, for example, the humor is part of it because you these really feel like characters with personalities, like characters where not every line of dialogue is just about, like, furthering the plot. Um, the set design is incredible. It just... Uh, so John, it's John Goodman's bunker, and it in the way when you just look around the room, you know so much about who this person is, and it's not just it's not just like a generic bunker. It's just like it's, like it's filled out with little details, and each one tells you a little bit more about like, oh, okay, he's this kind of person. This is how he thinks about life. This is how he thinks about the bunker. Totally, they set that up in the trailer. Like I remember watching the trailer, and I feel like I didn't notice it was a bunker until longer than I'd like to admit. Um, but like 
because he decorates it like a like a home den which kind of yeah, makes a- sense because to him totally. i think this is more home than his like real yeah, but as someone home. who's watched more doomsday preppers than i should admit to that's not typically what they those kind of places look like and so that actually again like really added to the storytelling and the atmosphere and like the, it and gives the you the, is so good it gives you the impression that he also like he viewed that as home but he also put more effort like i bet you anything if if they took us into his home, it wouldn't be half as nice and well yeah, done. Yeah, I bet there's like the nothing in his was. home. Yeah, like, that's probably true. But yeah, like you look at even like the kitchen and like the little like and like you look at the plates and the utensils and the glasses they use, and they're all specific. Well, they're not just generic, you know. Now, stuff. now another idea just popped into my mind. So when we want to switch to spoilers, <laughs> there's another point worth making about his his home versus his bunker. I feel like we should we're, we're about the place where we should go into spoilers. Well, okay. before we go into spoilers, one more th- one last thing. Mary Elizabeth Winstead in this movie, incredible. So yeah, good. She's and and so John many, Gallagher Jr. Totally. She's Mary Elizabeth Winstead's done a lot of horror movies, and a lot of them are forgettable. Like I totally forgot the thing happened. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not bad. Me I just too. completely forgot it happened because it was so unessential. But this is like this is great. She plays a final girl in this, and it's not your typical final girl. Like she doesn't need to be virginal. She doesn't need to be like scared into being strong. She's a very different kind of final girl, and I really dug it. They really weave in, you know, her knowledge, just like what she's good at, and how she figures out you know how to get out of this situation or guys back. Yeah, I feel like, yeah you know marvel needs a captain marvel just saying yeah Ooh, i've never <laughs> thought about that before but i kind of like it all right let's move into spoilers so if you haven't seen 10 cloverfield lane you might want to skip this section of the podcast and come back another time so spoiler warning your last chance to now now all right now for everyone who's still with us so going back to the thing with um with his house being let's say like not as nice as his bunker then it also brings in the situation with his fake daughter because well, like if he, he had, had a done... daughter no but i think daughter's had... real no oh, but that, you, you're the, talking with, about the second one. yeah like if he did that to her in the bunker before any of totally. this ever happened mm. so like he was probably like pulling the shit he in that bunker before bunker, yeah. anything really went down i think that's right I think that's accurate. Okay. I also just, what I thought was really interesting is that when you get into the full context of the movie, I feel like this can be a film about like women's health, honestly. And I know that sounds bizarre, but bear with me for a second. This is very quick. I can do this. So the movie is about a guy who captures Elizabeth Winstead and tells her the world outside is dangerous. You're going to stay here and live by my rules because I know what's best. And she basically is like, I don't know you. I don't know why you think you have the right to tell me what to do or what to do with my body. I'm getting the fuck out of here. And she escapes in the end, as you can see in the trailers. And the world is dangerous. He's not totally wrong. But also, she is a competent human and can deal with that on her own. She doesn't need some random guy telling her what to do with her body slash uterus. Not uterus specifically in the movie, but watching this, I was like, ooh. I didn't expect that coming. Yeah, (laughs) but so what do you guys think of the ending? Because I feel like, so most people I know like this movie, but the one thing that people seem kind of divided on is, I guess, the last 10 or so minutes. Like, I've seen a lot of people say this would be a great movie if it stopped 10 minutes earlier. Here's my suspicion. I bet you it did originally stop 10 minutes earlier. Uh, well, I, I don't know. I read an article today saying the original script, you don't see a mon you don't actually see the monster. You just kind of she she drives something to else Chicago and it's in like it's like in ruins or something. So she realizes know. something bad happens, but you don't actually It's see the extreme, monster. but I kind of like how big it went when everything else was kind of subdued before yeah. and yeah, how I it kind it. And I think it just like paired well where like one scenario enhanced what she had just experienced in a way that I wasn't expecting. Mm-hmm. And it does go big though with like a monster attack and her dangling from a car it's like maybe they could have pulled that back just a little and and done it in a little subtler way i think it's because they don't introduce any sci-fi elements and then all of a sudden it's a high it's it's a sci-fi action movie but and normally i think that would bother me but for this i liked it because this was playing with so many genre expectations that it was totally jarring to me and Mm -hmm. in the theater i was like i don't know if i like this but the more i kind of sat with it the more i enjoyed how it kind of felt true to life in a way where it's not like, you know, your life isn't just one tone. You like, you can walk into one moment and it's funny and the next moment and all of a sudden yeah. it's ridiculous. So like, I like that she literally left that hellscape behind and here's a totally different movie for her to live and in. And some of the best jokes come from that when she recognizes, she's like, like she says something like, seriously? I think she's she like, really? fuck. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's the something only where, fuck it's perfect. Yeah, and it's like a moment where she recognizes like, I just spent so long getting out of that place. Now My look at what I'm stuck with. only complaint with the ending is that the name 10 Cloverfield Lane gives away the ending. 
because we saw the trailer and it's like, why the fuck would they no. call this Cloverfield? Like, when Doesn't he keeps give away the ending. It's that didn't really mean address. That didn't really mean, that really mean anything to me. Here's what, because otherwise, if if there's not giant potentially extraterrestrial monsters running around, why call it Ten Cloverfield Lane at all? And like, for marketing tra- purposes, that's. The- Okay, so... No, so I get going- that, but within the context of the movie, like, that's what bumps me out, because if I didn't know this was a Cloverfield movie, I would have no reason to think there were actually, like, something dangerous outside, which would have made the tension of, is he right or is he a nut job stronger? But because I knew it was a Cloverfield movie, I knew there were going to be monsters in the end. Well, I was kind of expecting that, too, but it's not like it caught me any less off guard, because I was just so enthralled by everything that was happening before that when she did yeah. get out there, I was, I was like... I still really like the movie. It's just that I feel like the the Cloverfield connection is a bummer because it undercuts one of the. Elements I don't of think the we necessarily needed the ten Cloverfield Lane address. That's a bit much. But part of the reason I like the ending so much is that even though they were different monsters, those monsters felt like they could exist with the monster from the original movie, and something about the digital design of them matched that in a way that I believe that this is all happening for a reason. But they, Okay, so here's the thing. I asked Dan Trachtenberg, the director, when I interviewed him, how aware are the characters in 10 Cloverfield Lane of the events that happened in Cloverfield? And he said, they're not. They take place in separate timelines. So I guess even though they're trying to build this as like a Cloververse, that's actually the phrase that they're using. Oh boy. They're not actually, they don't actually have anything to do with each other other than like a few like thematic or tonal similarities and some Easter eggs. That's literally it. Yeah. Which again, I don't really care. I like the first Cloverfield, but I never needed a sequel to that. So I just like this movie. Yeah. It's fine. I feel it's like just, that connection just kind is of... potentially going to trip it up with fans. Like, I'm, I'll be curious to see what the cinema score is. I don't think that fans are like as hooked on proper mythology with Cloverfield as they are with, let's say, Civil War. I don't think anyone's really going to be I hung up on true. like, well, so-and-so's head but blew up in the first one and that doesn't happen. This is a totally different movie than Cloverfield. I mean, what they're trying to do like, basically is just establish and- what they're trying. I guess. I mean, it was a totally different movie in that this is this is like a, more of like a hostage, you yeah. know, thriller. Whereas that's a chase movie. But I mean, something about like the tone of the movie and like the visuals. But like, I don't know. It 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 felt like it matched to me. I don't know. I don't know that I feel like they matched, but I admittedly haven't watched Cloverfield in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say I like Ten Cloverfield name better than Quarter for Cloverfield. I thought it was more fun, and it kept me on my toes a lot more. I like them equally for different reasons. Oh, I think Cloverfield is, I'm sorry, boring oh, as shit. Here it comes. I love Cloverfield. It's so boring. But I could watch Cloverfield over and over and over again, and uh, I'm sure the same will happen now with 10 Cloverfield Lane. I mean, you like Chappie, so fuck you. Shut up. <laughs> shit just got real. Yeah, Andrew's really. Andrew's blowing up her career left and right. This is actually Paw Friend and Prosecco Civil War. That's what yep. the R uh, Wars <laughs> <being> went over. <laughs> All over Chappie. Hashtag I'll, Team Chappie. I'll never get past Chappie that. Chappie is I. your Bucky. <laughs> oh, Chappie is her Bucky. Oh, I'm fine with that, though. <gasps> oh, that's, that's horrifying. Cool. <laughs> all right, anyway, now, before this all goes off the rails, I guess we should just wrap up. 10 Cloverfield before. Lane. I think it's really good. I think, uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to be like, oh, if you know anything, it'll ruin it. I don't think that's true. But I think yeah. it is one, I think one of the interesting things about it is that it kind of keeps you twisting and turning and doesn't stick to an established formula. So I thought it was very good. That's, yeah. that's a pretty good uh, wrap up right there. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really fun. I think it's, it does unexpected things. And the cast is great. I absolutely think you should go see Ten Cloverfield Lane. Yep, I'm all for this movie as well, so go see it. Now, that is a wrap on episode 105 of Popcorn and Prosecco. You know where to go. We have Facebook, where you can like us. We have Twitter, at Popcorn Prosecco, where you can tweet at us. We have our website, popcornprosecco.com. Go to iTunes and subscribe, and please rate and comment over there as well. And then all three of us are all over the internet, too. Angie, do you want to go first? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at AJHAN, and I write for SlashFilm.com. Christy? I write all over the internet. You can find career highlights at DecadentCriminals.com, and you can find me on Twitter at Christy Puchko. I also want to throw out that Angie has a special post on Pajiba right now about her hatred of guys wearing the drive jacket, and it's hilarious, and you should absolutely go look for it. Good plug. Thank you. And uh, keep an eye out for me and Perry. We'll We'll be tweeting and sharing reviews from South By all week. Oh, yeah. And you can find my Twitter at pnemeroff and my writing at collider.com. So that's it for this week, and we'll see you next time. Something's coming.